Okay, welcome to the very first SwingCast podcast. Uh, I am Scott Lynn, the Research Director and uh, Director of Education for Swing Catalyst, and we're here with Bernie Najar, uh, one of our first users um, and ambassadors. Uh, he's based out of Baltimore, Maryland, just outside of Baltimore, at a really awesome golf course uh, called Caves Valley. How you doing, Bernie? Doing great, Scott. How about yourself? I'm doing very well, thank you. So you have the senior tour coming there in a couple of weeks, don't you? Actually, this week. Oh, this week. We are playing the Senior Tour Players Championship. Awesome. Bernard Lambert's in the field, as well as some of the best players in the world on the Champions Tour. Cool. Should be a great week. Nice. So, that course beat me up pretty good. Do they play it all the way back? Playing it a little over 7,000, so they're challenging the guys, but they'll we'll tear it up. Awesome, awesome. All right, so during this podcast, what we're trying to do is just to see how some of our users are using uh, the Swing Catalyst motion plate or balance plate um, to help their students. And so Bernie has a really cool example he's going to show for us here um, regarding a student he's been working with. Um, and Bernie and I have both been working pretty closely with uh, Mike Adams in a system we've kind of developed using the Swing Catalyst motion plate. So uh, if you want to talk a little bit about the system we've developed first, and then we'll, we'll get into the swing. Sure. Well, Mike Adams, a great friend of both Scott and I, and one of the best professionals you'll meet in the golf business, has uh, done a lot of work on looking at the body over the years with his system of bioswing dynamics. And bioswing dynamics gets into evaluating players based on, on their structure. And, you know, we look at certain key factors, how uh, those factors influence the swing, and then with the swing catalyst motion plate, we're able to see how the forces are being applied correctly, or we'll just say uh, there might be situations where a player isn't using the ground as well as they could for their structure. And you know, with with the swing catalyst balance plate, you get to see the pressure information from a vertical pressure standpoint, but when you get under the hood and look at things with the motion plate which I'm fortunate to be able to do at my facility, uh, we now get to see how the player is using horizontal force, the torque they're generating, as well as the vertical force component and the heel-to-toe graph that's also important. So uh, you can certainly get a lot from both plates, and when you combine that information, it's really powerful, and you can help your players pick up distance and improve their accuracy. So it's really exciting to to tie in what we do with swing catalyst with bioswing dynamics and then uh, with whatever you might be doing with your players just to find different opportunities to make them more efficient. Awesome, awesome. So I think what we're going to talk about today is mainly the, the one of the three main power sources that we've discovered with the swing catalyst plate that we use uh, to produce speed in the golf swing. So one of the power sources is the glide or the linear power source. The second you talked about is the torque or the angular power source. And the third is the vertical or the launching power source. So Mike and I talk about it as a glider, a spinner, and a launcher. And what traditionally we've always thought of is that glide or sway in the golf swing would be a bad thing. Um, and most teachers have been for a long time trying to take sway out of most people's swings. W would you agree with that? Yeah, I think we, we had a pretty long stretch of rotation, 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 or, you know, you hear the word turn in golf, but uh, there's a side bend component while this is all happening, or a, a gliding component where the players are applying that force, and certain cases you need a lot more of that to make the rotation effective in the golf swing, and what we get to do with the swing catalyst, we have to see the magnitude of those forces and what I've found, and this is something I've learned from Mike Adams and certainly time with you, Scott, where if we get a player with longer arms relative to their height, that certainly increases the need for more glide or horizontal force in their swing. And if they don't have enough and we happen to put them on the motion plate, we can see right away that's a great opportunity to help their swing. Because in often cases, that player, if they rotate early, the club is going to come down in the wrong plane for their body type and they're not going to be as efficient. So in my student example, uh, I have a player, yeah, he's uh, a low handicap player and you know what what he needs is a little more glide and he was working on more rotation than he really needed at this particular moment in time. We hadn't worked together in some I'd say about 
eight months and he came in for a tune up. It was not hitting it as well. And I was able to use the swing catalyst to help him see that. So we'll go through that awesome. in this example. Here we yeah. go here. So let me see if I can make this work. Sure. Go there. And for those of you watching while Scott's queuing this up, uh, the gliding force is, you'll see it in every golfer. You know, when you transition from the top, everybody uses some form of glide. Uh, the amount you use is going to be relative to your needs, but uh, what you really need in a lot of golf swings is more horizontal force to help the downswing get underway in the right direction, where a lot of folks are just turning from the top of the swing. And when you do that, easy to get over the top right. and easy to end up not as efficient at impact. And that's what we're, we've discovered is the, the kinetic sequence. So uh, in terms of the, the ground reaction forces, the first force that has to peak in, in every player that we've seen is the glide or the linear force, followed by the torque and followed by the vertical force. So I think this glide or this linear force is something that has been kind of traditionally ignored. So uh, this is a really interesting case here. So we have uh, your player here in the black shirt, which was, you say, uh, a couple months ago or? So he's actually, this was, these lessons were 10 days apart, 10 days apart and okay. we brought in uh, some data from the swing catalyst, showed them what was going on. And you know, a lot of times with your players, you have to reinforce your message just by measuring, right? So we get the swing catalyst where we can show them how their forces are being generated in their swing and then to take them and measure their wingspan to height, for example, and, and show them, hey, look here, you're plus two and a half inches sure. on, on that side of the equation. So... Gary's swing on the left, it certainly would look great if you watched him hit balls and hold up a lot of nice shots, but he was not as powerful as he normally is. And what had happened is swing got a little short, mm -hmm. a little flat for his natural arm plane, sure. and was lacking a little glide. Right. So his misses were weakened to the right, and we made an adjustment to his backswing plane. If you cue the swing from a dress here, sure. they'll be able to see that. Well, let's just show off a little bit here. So just to make this clear, we have a swing here on the left here that uh, has a carry of 175. You can see it's 57.3 feet offline to the right. Uh, the club head speed is 89.5 miles per hour. Um, and this was 10 days earlier. Let's go back to our uh, ball flight there. Um, and then 10 days later, we have a 216 yard carry with a 96 mile an hour uh, ball speed. Unfortunately, the launch monitor missed a couple of variables there, but uh, that's a pretty impressive change in, in just a few lessons or one lesson. Um, and one thing you'll notice here is the maximum vertical force here is only 19% in the original force, or sorry, the maximum horizontal force or gliding force is only 19% and you actually took him up 2%. So we've added more sway or more glide to the swing, um, which is very interesting. And I think what you talked about is really important is it's related to, I think, two main factors um, that are anatomically based, which is one is their wingspan. So if their wingspan is longer than their height, that club will naturally be a little steeper um, and they're going to need to add more glide to shallow the club um, as it comes down to impact. I um, mean, another, um, can you tell me something about his uh, forearm to upper arm length? Yeah, for sure. So from his elbow to knuckle, uh, that distance is longer than his elbow to shoulder socket. So that's another contributing factor to having the shaft come down a little higher or more off the top of the right shoulder. And if you don't have enough glide, it's hard to really get the club in the proper slot to hit a golf ball. Exactly. So those were considerations. And again, you got to reinforce that with your players. And we certainly talk about that in our level two certification to reinforce how to use this information. Right, so if you want me to, if you can talk through it here as we take them back to the top. Here yes, you can see, see Sorry. Go ahead. much higher plane there in the backswing with the shaft because mm -hmm. he had gotten a little low and now he's got more time and space to flatten the club in the downswing. We've got a little glide work in here and you'll see as you continue down Transition here stronger with the right side driving. Shafts flattening here nicely and a lot more distance. And like I mentioned, Gary's a long hitter. Uh, we might have been a little bit downwind from the pickup that much distance, but the fact is he was <laughs> there on the left than he should be. Right. And, you know, being a guy that likes to hit it hard, he wasn't feeling he had much in the tank. And a lot of times it's just a matter of showing people hey, here's what's going on, here's an adjustment to help you uh, 
get back to where you need to be. And then being able to see that, you know, it's really powerful to see the peak on that graph and, and just to see how the timing of it is. So, you know, as we, as we did this, we just increased his drive from the right side. He felt like his right leg was pushing into the ground for a longer period of time with his lower body still angled away from the target and voila, some nice distance, some improved accuracy. And more importantly, he's left the lesson with what to do, how to feel it, and he can go out and work on it. And he played some really good golf since this lesson. That's awesome. Uh, and I think then you also have this swing archived here. If, if this is you know one of his ideal swings here, 216-yard carry with, I don't, it looks like a mid-iron there to me, which is pretty impressive. Sure. And this little baby draw, um, if things go haywire again down the road, you have all the forces um, archived so you can go back to it and see which one had gotten off or there's too much of this now and too, too little of that so I think it really helps you point your arrow to keep people uh, moving in the right direction at all times. Yeah it's really nice and great thing with Swing Catalyst is like you mentioned you log the data and more importantly uh, you can also get in there with the software and do some drills and people can see the pressures in that analysis screen uh, but what we all have to do is coaches is make sure our players understand what they want to do and the swing catalyst software gives us a great opportunity to show them send them a little voiceover and they're on their way awesome thank you so much bernie so if you're interested in learning more about uh, this system we've created and the swing catalyst products uh, we will be doing two level two seminars in the coming weeks uh, the first one will be in nienberg germany from july 31st to august 1st and will be hosted by martin stecker there um, and the second will be in Hampstead, Sweden, uh, from August 4th to the 5th. And Eric Bloomquist will be our host there. So Bernie and I are going to make the trek over to Europe and hopefully survive the uh, German Autobahn to, uh, to, <laughs> to do those two seminars. And That's right. We uh, learn a lot from you guys in the process. So thanks so much for your time, Bernie. And uh, we will see you all in Europe, hopefully, in a couple weeks. Sounds great. All right. Take care, Bernie. You too, Scott. Bye now.